All right, we are live. Thanks yeah. everybody for, <laughs> yes. Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah and I work for Buttonwood Winery. And tonight we're talking to some wonderful ladies for our um, Women's History Month kind of bonanza. It's the last night that we're gonna be talking. And uh, we've just stretched out um, International Women's Day to go for the whole month of March. We've been talking every Friday evening at 5.30, tasting some wines and talking about different topics related to the wine industry. Um, if you haven't checked in with us before, you should know that we have some really great deals going on for wines by these ladies. So if you would like to get yourself a great discount on some excellent wine, make sure you check out the link in the description below this video or in the event, um, the event lingo. <laughs> Sorry. Um, check out that link and make sure that you get some of these wines because the deals are ending at the end of the month. So you have a few more days, okay? Um, so tonight we're talking about different kinds of varietals that these women winemakers are using here in California. So it's going to be a really unique kind of tasting. And again, if you hear something that you really want to try, you want to check out the link so that you can buy some for yourself. All right. So we're going to go through and just introduce everyone. Let's start with, uh, Anna. Hi, um, I'm Anna Clifford, Lynn Kuki. Wayne Sutsky, complicated, Polish. Anyway, um, I am the winemaker owner for Final Girl Wines with my husband. So we make kind of a, a bunch of different wines, but kind of our two more obscure ones are Chenin Blanc and uh, Petit Verdot. Awesome. And Gretchen? Hi, I'm Gretchen Volker. I'm the winemaker and owner of Luna Hart and the winemaker for Piazza Family Wines. And I get to work with a lot of uh, kind of kooky varietals, um, Gruner and Cab Franc from Luna Hart. We'll talk about Lu Cab Franc tonight. And uh, Graziano, Nebbiolo, Montepulciano from Piazza. Cool. Awesome. And then we've got the dynamic duo over here, Mireya and Tara. Hi, Mireya. I'm Tara. <laughs> and we are owners and winemakers for Coming to Dreams. And at Camins to Dreams, um, we do like as fun varieties, Gruner, uh, which we're going to be tasting tonight. And also, we just started making some Graciano. And then we also make other varieties, but that one's are Grenache not that fun. Grenache and Syrah, <laughs> which are not that fun, but. <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking about those ones tonight. <laughs> awesome, cool. And we also have uh, Karen from Buttonwood Winery. Uh, she's having some internet issues. Oop, I think she's actually logging on right now. Um, so she'll pop in here in a little bit. And um, just so everybody knows, uh, please feel free to leave questions, comments on the wine, anything you'd like in the comments, and I will throw that out to uh, the group to answer any of those questions. Uh, let's just keep that flowing throughout this conversation. All right, here comes Karen. Oh, she wasn't quite ready. <laughs> Just kidding, we'll come back to her. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start out tonight by talking about um, you know, why California producers are so interested in doing things outside of the box. So why we're so obsessed with like these kind of weird niche sort of uh, varietals. So Anna, you want to start us out on that? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, you know, I think it's kind of important to note that, uh, there we go. There's Karen. Um, it's important to note that 90% of the wine from America is produced in California. So I think that's probably got a big part of it. There's so many different grape varieties that are grown here. So many different opportunities um, for, you know, geeky winemakers like ourselves to kind of find something that we think is unique and kind of our market. I think also it helps, you know, there's so much wine produced in a region that, um, or like in a state that, you know, it gives us the opportunity to kind of stand out by doing something a little bit obscure. Awesome. Karen, you want to jump in and say hi? Hi. I don't know. Something about Friday night at about 5.30, the internet goes down here almost like clockwork. 
<laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Obscure varietals. Well, um, well, the other thing I guess in Santa Barbara County is because of the transverse ranges, we can grow so many uh, different things so well. Um, we're not really limited to uh, certain microclimates. I mean, basically, you can go a mile one way or the other way, and you can find a perfect um, place to grow just about anything here. So that's another thing. And I think here in Santa Barbara County, particularly, we're a little bit of mavericks. I mean, we don't we don't necessarily just follow the straight and narrow path and the norm. Um, if there's a weird thing out there that we're gonna we're gonna go check it out. That's for sure. Awesome. Um, so then maybe we can hear from the other groups here uh, about kind of the benefits or the disadvantages that you have. So like pros or cons of working with these kinds of uh, varietals. Mireya and Tara, you want to start it out? Sure. Yeah. I mean, for us, like when we decided to start making it was more like an advantage than anything we could do. You know, we're so small and Santa Rita Hills is known for Chardonnay and Pinot. So we wanted to choose a wide wine, a variety that uh, was not that known. Uh, so people would like be more interested in what we were doing because like compete with all the Chardonnays and Pinots that are out there. It's like super hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, and we love Gruner. That's the reason why we made it. But <laughs> but then it's like everybody that comes to this room is like, oh, there's no other Gruner here. There's maybe like four or five more gruners in the area where we are. So there's mm -hmm. really not that many tasting rooms that have it or wineries that have it available. So that's, that's brief. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Gretchen, you want to jump in on that? Yeah. Um, I definitely choose Gruner and Cap Rock because they're my favorite varietals and they are a little bit uh, obscure for sure. But I also think that um, one of the beauties of Santa Barbara County as well is that we're so close to L.A. and L.A. is down with trendy. Um, and so it sort of helps encourage us to be able to do things like that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Great. So let's go into a little bit of uh, in-depth chat. Uh, whose dog is barking? <laughs> oh, that's my... <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah, dogs and kids and my cat's not here tonight. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into some details here. We're going to hop over to Camines to Dreams hey. and um, taste through some wines. You want to talk about the varietals and kind of why you're working with those and taste through them for us? Sure. So so this is um, <laughs> Camines to Dreams, um, Gruner Veltliner. It's um, from Spear Vineyard here in Santa Rita Hills. Um and we actually source that and Syrah from that particular vineyard, but it's actually located like down at the bottom. When you first enter into the vineyard, so it's like the coolest location um, in of the entire vineyard. Um, and so it, it takes a little bit of time for it to ripen, <laughs> but that's Anarita Hills for you and um, soil profile. Uh, you have, I mean, it's an organic vineyard, so you have a lot of organic matter, but then you also have a lot of clay and, um, and like sandy silt soils, um, you know, mixed in with that. Um, so, um, Santa Rita Hills in general, just so unique because of the diatomaceous earth that you find, um, throughout, um, our area. Um, and, um, uh, it's just... Gruner Veltliner is just such a fun varietal for us to work with. Um, we just really love the acidity. We love the brightness in it. We um, and we love Gruner <laughs> in general. Yeah, yeah. We um, our the way we make this is like we we really try to showcase the variety by itself. Obviously, we are not in Austria, so we can really not compare to Austrian Gruners. But uh, we like to look for that freshness and that minerality and uh, just like super fruit friendly wine and and it's kind of like easy for a winemaker uh to make that naturally here uh our wines are all like you know like fermented natural yeast we try to really showcase the variety and they are refined and filtered so when you get grapes that they already have like the great chemistry that it has like when you pick from here so that's that's way easier and that's why we chose also to 
to get uh, a variety like this uh, that we like, that it has high quality, normally low pH, and, and it's just um, great for the style of wine that we want to make. So. And so along with this, uh, what we did was that we, we brought it in. I mean, we pick in the middle of the night. We bring it in. Um, we do a little bit of foot stomping to kind of start to macerate it. So it goes through like a five hour maceration in the cold room before we actually bring it out to, to start the press cycle. Um, so it's like a pre maceration um, with the skins for about five hours. Just to get a little bit more of the, the structure uh, and a little bit more of that. Um, yeah, like aromatics and everything from the skin. So. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. And then um, we don't add anything to it because it's all natural. Um, just right at bottle, um, we we do add a, a really small amount of SO2 just to be able to get it to bottle and um, and then preserve it um, until we <laughs> were ready to release it. So so yeah, I mean we we have a lot of fun working with all these different vineyards um, that we work with here in Santa Rita Hills. And um, as everyone said, it's just such a unique place. Do you find that uh, a disadvantage is that people can't pronounce the grape? <laughs> uh, I mean, the second part of the grape is complicated, but Gruner is not that difficult. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious. <laughs> but no, actually. No. Just call it, call it groovy. Groovy? Yeah. <laughs> groovy. Yeah, what, what's difficult is when you go to Austria and try to pronounce it. We were we were actually earlier before this on a Zoom call with a producer from Austria who makes Gruner, and none of us could really pronounce it. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, so this is easy for us. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, and just so those of you on Facebook, just so you know, I'm having some issues with the comments right now. So um, if you're asking questions, I apologize. I'm trying to fix it at the moment. So <laughs> I have a I have a question for Cara, for Tara and Maria. How what's the name? Tell us about the name of the winery. Oh, so I'm from Catalonia in in Spain. So uh, Camins means path in Catalan, which is my language. So it's the path to our dreams. So when Tara and I met um, back in 2006. Uh, we used to go like for eight years back and forth from Spain to here to California. And uh, she would come to Spain. I would take her through all Europe to taste uh, different wines and visit wineries. And I would come here. She would do the same with me up and down California. And we always say that it's through all these routes that we took and paths that led us to back here to Santa Barbara County to make our dream wines and have our dream winery. So it's coming to dreams, the path to our dreams. I love that. That's so cute. Because <laughs> we are cute. <laughs> we are cute. <laughs> Maria looks like she's dressed for Austria. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. What do we have next? Um, yeah, I've got a. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Uh, there's. Thing. Do do? Bum, bum. Shannon Blanc. So. Um, just really quickly, I don't know, sometimes I do have to explain. So not only do I have to explain what my varietals are, but I often have to explain where we got our winery name from. <laughs> well, at least you guys reminded me to do that. But uh, a final girl is like the last girl standing in a horror movie. So she's pretty much a badass and she kicks a lot of butt. So I feel like inside, that's what I really strive for. Um, and my husband writes horror movies and is a huge wine aficionado. So when we met, I'd already been making wine for a couple of years for my own brand, but I didn't have a name and no plan to sell it. Luckily we were making very big reds. So, you know, we had time, but, um, yeah, so we wanted to make it a combination of our two things. And so we went with the horror movie theme and kind of, cause it was my dream and my thing. We went with final girl. <laughs> anyway, kind of fun. So anyway, Chenin Blanc. Uh, we get our Chenin Blanc from Jurassic Park Vineyard, also known as it's Curtis Vineyard, but everyone affectionately refers to it uh, as Jurassic Vineyard because there's a sign that says Jurassic Park. Um, and it's uh, owned by Andrew Murray and it's a really cool spot. I mean, it's, sorry, that's my dog now. Um, 
<laughs> it's a really, we've got rid of the baby and now we've got a dog. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's a really interesting spot. Like they're 40 year old vines. Uh, they're very old. They're on this super sandy loam soil um, and they really struggle there. So similarly to, you know, what Tara was saying about the vineyards that you're dealing with in um, Santa Rita, it takes a super long time to ripen. And that really is interesting for Chenin Blanc. Um, Chenin Blanc, obviously from the Loire. So kind of cool that Gretchen brought a Cab Franc, but um, is uh, kind of a unique um wine, I mean, a unique grape. It's pretty malleable, like whatever you want to do with it. It's really open to lots of winemaking um, techniques, which is one of the things that drew me to it as well. But um, it's kind of somewhere in between what you would think of like a Sauvignon Blanc or a Gruner, that like really bright aromatic um, white style and like a Chardonnay, which is super malleable, but you know tends to be fermented in one particular way. So I thought it was kind of a cool midpoint between you know, what I've done in my career. I've worked at a lot of places making Sauvignon Blanc and currently I make a whole lot of Chardonnay from mm -hmm. a good So um, I thought that was kind of fun. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> oh yeah, so the way to make it, by the way, uh, this one, it's, um, it always gets picked pretty low uh, sugars because it just takes forever. This one actually was, um, ended up being harvested super late so it was like you know late end of october um in 2019 but so this has a much higher alcohol than our other uh shenons that we've made but um the we ended up basically barrel fermenting it and kind of keeping it in barrel aging it surly and stirring it a whole lot so it does get a little bit of reduction but we kind of felt that was kind of true to its loirean heritage also loirean probably not a word <laughs> <laughs> We, we use in the United States. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask you, do you use conventional yeast or, or is it? Well, we, yeah, we do use conventional yeast. Um, uh, and that's kind of all we add is yeast. We Luckily, because it takes so long, like we don't really have to adjust the acids. So we're pretty lucky. Like I picked to aim to not adjust the acids. Yeah. Similarly, like I strive to be more natural ones, but I feel like just my career and stuff with uh, aromatic whites, it kind of, sometimes they need a little bit more help. So with Fennin, it's maybe one of those grapes that uh, needs a little bit of a push to get the fruit in there. Otherwise it's all like, you know, minerals and hay and just plain old apple. So I kind of wanted to do that. Cool. Do you find <laughs> that um, in that area, things are like, people are much more, familiar with Shannon these days? Yeah, yes. Shannon's much more well known, I'd say, than um, it used to be, probably, yeah. um, in, you know, years ago or whatever. But, uh, and typically, like, something else, like, about our brand is we're a little bit more genre because we are horror themed. Like, obviously, we, we try to make serious wines, but we're sort of our goal is to kind of reach a broader audience that maybe wouldn't necessarily like, you know, go for nerdy wines or wouldn't feel like as welcome in the wine industry. Um, so, uh, you know, we kind of also feel like in that same way as like people that love horror movies, it's like kind of a unique style. And so we kind of want to bring these cool wines that we love to those same people. Nice. So, yeah. Do you, do you find it throws a really big crop, Anna? Yeah, the, it's, well, that's part of the reason it takes forever to ripen because you'll have one side of the cluster that's like, you know, getting sunburnt. The clusters are massive and then you kind of turn it over and you've still got green berries. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 2020 was a perfect example since we had kind of crazy heat spikes that um, we ended up picking it. And, you know, I like sampled it every which way. And so did lots of other people. I know they're getting fruit from the same vineyard and everyone came up with very different bricks at harvest and it ended up being 21 bricks so, <laughs> like, <laughs> so it's a, a lighter one this, than it was in 19. In 19 we actually managed it got up to 23 and a half so that was kind of like what I was targeting for the fruit profile mm -hmm. but turned out pretty similar so I guess nice. you know <laughs> that vineyard just does what it wants to do. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing vineyard. Yeah, it's a pretty big crop. I'm growing it now, and it, it's like it really throws a big crop, and they're yeah. big clusters. Yeah. Yes, huge clusters. Awesome. Delicious. Delicious. 
Yeah. 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 Jurassic Park's an amazing vineyard. Really yeah, it's, cool. it's really, really cool. And so I don't know if you can see, if people can see, but um, the label has a dinosaur on it. It's probably some sort of copyright infringement, but you know, it's not exactly <laughs> like <laughs> You can't tell it's a T-Rex, so. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And um, Mireya and Tara, I, I apologize. I thought you had a second wine, so that's why we moved on. I don't know if everybody got to taste Camines to Dreams. That's did fine. All, oh, I'm sorry. Play? I totally... Oh, no. Oh. Dang it. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, I've been drinking the Camines to Dreams for a while now, so I just figured I'm <laughs> drinking I it now, so it's good. Yeah. <laughs> We can Great. go back to it if anybody has questions, but if not, yeah. it's good. Yeah, let's let's taste it. Let's go through it real quick because um, I don't want to miss out on that opportunity. Sorry, I, I apologize. That was my my fault there. Huh? So, what, what are we doing? <laughs> let's taste through through your wine. Taste your Grunier. Did should we let her finish? Did she already describe hers? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Hello, <laughs> Tara. Going through, going through the bumps here. Okay, let's. Um, I don't know. Didn't we? No, we didn't. Oh. So we get a lot of. Sorry about that. Names? No, oh, all good. Um, our Gruner, um, get a lot of acidity in it. You get a lot of stone fruit. Um, you get a little bit of of green apple greenness to it. Um, herbaceousness. Um, I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, like uh, creaminess. Yeah, it's just like all that. <laughs> I think this this site and your wine is a perfect example of it. Also, really brings out like the frankincense and myrrh characters that Gruner can have um, in like its herbaceous pro profile. And I really, I love. I don't see that in other sites of Gruner that I work with. I really love that. Oh, cool. Beautiful. How much Gruner is there out there in San Diego? Did you have some? Who else Wait, has it? What? Okay. Pardon? Who has, who ha how much uh, Gruner is there out in San Rita Hills? There's. I know Kat Kathy has some and that's Spear. Kathy. GSB. Yeah. GSB. Yeah. That's it. And then in Los Olivos, there's some um, scattered around. Yeah, I think in Santa Rita Hills, it's only like maybe three acres. Yeah, if that. <laughs> wow, very yeah. small. You made you made some from a spear too, right, Gruner? I mean, you're still making it from a spear, or <laughs> I mean, Gretchen. <laughs> no, Gretchen. <laughs> <Mitchell. laughs> um, yeah, so I worked with fiddlesticks for two years, and then um, I've worked with spear for two years. And this past year in 2020, I actually did a Gruner from both vineyards, which was really cool to see the really the site specificity. Um, and I'm super excited because this year I'm going to be making some sparkling Gruner in addition nice. to the sphere. Cool. So. Cool. We, we actually make some sparkling Gruner too. We make some that. Uh, nice, nice. So that's, it's, it's actually really nice to make it. Yeah. yeah. Super crisp and yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Yay. Awesome. Well, <laughs> shall we move on to uh, Mr. Jackson? Trying yeah. to get out of the sun. I can't. Let's do it. Oh, let's have some frock. <laughs> Moving on into the reds. What what makes Cab Franc so weird and geeky and fun to work with? Well, I think um, people... A lot of people that aren't super familiar with it just automatically put it in the category with Cab Sauv, um, and some producers sort of make it in the style of a more Bordeaux bold style. Um, and mine, I certainly aim to be more sort of true to the Loire Valley um, and always let it stand alone. And I think also Cab Franc is really cool. Um, this vintage in particular, the 2017, I experimented with the varietal across the whole county. Um, and so this is a blend of three different vineyards. And I really wanted to learn about how microclimates affect a variety like Cab Franc. And it was completely eye-opening. Um, I, I worked with Brick Barn furthest to the west, almost Santa Rita Hills. They're also the youngest vines. 
um, and then Rock Hollow in Los Olivos District, um, and then Star Lane in Happy Canyon. And um, all three, I've identified them fairly similarly. Um, 2017 was a tough year for late ripening varietals, but, um, but yeah, it was so eye-opening and fascinating how different it was in all the different microclimates. Um, kind of in the cooler climate, it was really red fruit dominant and really velvety texture. Um, Rock Hollow had like a lot more kind of black fruit notes and, and that strikingly violet nose that I always pick up on. Um, as well as all the tannin in this wine um, and the body. And then the Star Lane was surprisingly the least expressive and like kind of just brought like a really smoky aspect um, to Cap Franc. Um, and so ultimately I uh, decided to blend all three together. And I think it's really cool because you get all those layers of complexity in this wine um, from the different sites. Awesome. Yeah, I, I got to say Cab Franc is probably my favorite uh, grape to work with. It's, it's just an interesting one. Yeah. That uh, people are searching it out now. It's very, yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> and this okay. one sort of kind of, I mean, I've been doing this super small production for a few years leading up to this, but this wine really was the first wine that really put me on the map and got a lot of recognition and it's really exciting to, to feel, to see how excited people are about it. Right. Nice. It's all um, neutral oak. All neutral oak, 10% whole cluster. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from our, our friends at Facebook because I got that working again. Yay. Um, so before we move on to the, the super weird wine from Miss Karen, uh, Let's just have a quick chat of most difficult grape you've worked with. Does anybody have a good story for that? Well, I find I find Franck really. Um, I was going to think of Franck. Diva like, yeah, diva, diva grape. I mean, you know, I came to Buttonwood from. I'm trying to get out of the sun here, so uh, from uh, Fiddlehead, where we did, you know, Pinot and Sauvignon Blanc, and. But that was back in the days of Sideways, too, and everyone talked about, like, you know, oh, Miss Pinot Noir, and she's so fussy. And and honestly, Pinot Noir, I don't think it's got anything on growing Cab Franc or vinifying Cab Franc. Or, I mean, you have to play music to the barrels just to keep her happy. Um, she's a diva. I, I worked with Cab Franc in Spain, and it was super difficult to have it, like, two years in a row the same. We were also making Cafranc at 3,000 feet in the Pyrenees, so obviously it was probably not the best um, <laughs> for Cafranc because it was, like, super cold. But it's also, like, we we're, like, really high, so we had, like, really strong insulation. So so it would be always, like, either getting burned or, like, it would never ripe. So it was just, like, so yeah. difficult to get, like, Cafranc always at the same, you know, like, same, similar structure or flavor and I think each year it was just like yeah it's a parrot I guess part of the, I, 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 here's our cat <laughs> my cat's not here today he's in the other house yeah Anna do you have a, a bridal um, I would say probably one of the toughest weirdest things I've had to work with was uh Albarino from Lodi and Ooh. that was just because of the, yeah, the growing conditions and the pH was yeah. way too high and the TA was also not that low. So it was a really mm -hmm. awkward way to try to wow. turn into something pretty. So that's probably the toughest one. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah, those super hot climates are, are yes. tough. <laughs> yes. I'm very happy that I make wines in Santa Barbara County now where we've got, you know, a little bit more coolness. Absolutely. and So yeah. fingers crossed. Stay that way. <laughs> we, talked about it, uh, we talked about it a little bit last week with our sustainability chat. Just the Santa Barbara, I don't know why it's not a more um, well-known region. You know, it's it's yeah. really, we got to get the promotions out there because, man, it is just perfect conditions for just about anything. 
it's really just a special place. And like we discussed, I, I think it was last week, has the most women winemakers. So mm -hmm. it's doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's yeah. probably the fact, the fact that we have so many different varieties makes it more yeah. unknown because you see Napa, everybody knows what's in Napa. You see, I know, like Paso, everybody knows what you make in Paso. You see Santa Barbara County, what do you make? You make everything. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's really very interesting. <laughs> It's an impossible marketing message. Like, you know, the, the marketing message is, yes, we do everything great. And, you know, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's really hard to yeah. position yourselves as, but we do. It's we not a bad, it, it really isn't a bad no. problem to have, you know, it's kind no. of like, a, <laughs> it's a good problem. <laughs> I mean, we really grow everything from Albarino to Zinfandel here. Yeah. Wow. Cool. All right. <laughs> what? Do we have Zinfandel in Santa Barbara County? It's not Happy yeah. Canyon. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> That's awesome. Fun fact of the day. Learning stuff. And their head, the right? their head train, too. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. wow. Yeah. What vineyard? I don't know the names of the ones over there. Oh. <laughs> She's like, don't put me in the spot. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> hey, we're coming out of Garrett oh. over that side of the highway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. So now we've been talking about different varietals and kind of uniqueness that we can find there. Karen, would you like to talk about a completely different style that I, I think probably the amount of producers that do something like this, you could count on your fingers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the varietal is not that unusual. Well, it is Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but it is infused with estate grown hops. So um, it was very difficult to get through a uh, licensing because we were the first to commercially grow it, grow it to make a hopped wine. Um, the, you know, for those of you in the, on the uh, outside don't realize we have to have our labels um, approved by the federal government before we're allowed to sell them particularly across state lines. And uh, they didn't know what to do with a uh, wine that had hops in it. Although there are not any hops in it. I mean, I tried to explain this to the federal, you know, the TTB, which is our agency. Like the way we make this is, um, well, the backstory, first of all, is like I'm involved with the world of Pinot Noir. And before the official um, public events at the world of Pinot Noir, we have a technical symposium for two days where I know Tara has been there. Um, Anna, you've been there, right? At the tax yeah. symposium? Yeah. 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 So we, we're kind of sequestered for two days someplace, and there's about 80 winemakers, and we all taste Pinot Noir blind from the just-released vintage. And that that sounds like a lot of fun, but by the time you get to dinner, all you want is something other than Pinot. Cocktails. So our, our <laughs> friend, Mike, Mikey Guioni, who was a cider maker at the time also from Scar of the Sea, he, was, he made this hopped cider. And it was like the most refreshing thing. And you know how you can tell that the favorite wine in a group of winemakers is the one that has the empty bottle. So that was like the favorite. And I kept thinking, well, if Mikey can do it with apples, I don't know why I can't do it with grapes. So we started out just like, you know, you know, playing around with um, hop pellets and things. And then we really liked it. And uh, we started growing hops. So the way that we make this is we uh, take wine from the previous vintage. So in this case, it would be from 2020 and 21. We pick the hops we, and we then add these wet hops, three different kinds, Citra, uh, Cascade, and uh, Chinook. Chinook. We, chose those, <laughs> we chose those for aromatics. And then we basically put them in a giant tea bag and we infuse the wine with the hops for about three and a half, four weeks until it really starts smelling... Um, Hoppy in the in the cellar. Um, some people now, because we're in Santa Barbara County, walk in and think I'm making cannabis wine, but I am not. <laughs> <laughs> but hops, hops and cannabis are related uh, from a genetic perspective. So sometimes it's a little skunky. It is not cannabis, I promise. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then after that, because and the reason we do that with the previous vintages, we don't want to have any heat uh, going on while we're doing this infusion because the heat for brewing 
is designed to like to extract the bittering characters out of hops. And we don't want that part. We just want the aromatics. So we, we kind of let this thing steep almost like a big pea um, for, you know, about a month. And then we filter it and we bottle it. And it's, it's, um, it's really kind of, it's geek. It's, I mean, talk, talk about nerdy. It's really nerdy. It's really fun though. When, you know, I mean, all of us have seen some of those, um, uh, I mean, and there's there's not many of them, but every once in a while you run into one of those uh, snobby psalms that think they know exactly everything about everything. And then you put this in front of them and ask them to see what they think it is. Never get it. Never get it. We have had <laughs> cannabis wine, but um, so it's called, now, and it's called Hop On. Um, when I tried to get the label approved, I went through, I probably have the record for rejections from the federal government. And finally, I just talked to a lady at TTB and I said, you know, what do you want me to call this? Because, I, you know, I need to ship it. It's going in our, our, we have a winemaker selection thing in our wine club that I get to like send people wacky stuff. And um, she told me I had to call it white wine with natural flavors. <laughs> cannot have an appellation. It cannot have a vintage. It can't have a varietal. Crazy. So it, it just says white wine with natural flavors. Barrel fermented hopped white wine, natural flavors. And then this is a kind of what got me in trouble on the back. I say inspired by the winemaking crew at harvest time. I think I had the word beer in there, which we got them. We dry hop a barrel fermented Sauvignon Blanc with our favorite hops. So um, that that is my, um, I, I'm going for the award, the Sarah award for the wackiest wine. <laughs> well uh lamar over on facebook said this wine changed my life karen <laughs> uh, yes well i hope to the better lamar Not, you know. <laughs> just for anyone who's tasting at home or like that doesn't have this wine at home it's really good karen this is really it's cool, cool isn't it yeah. well, it's it's also kind of this bridgey wine for like your guy your people that don't like wine sometimes will like it now i think there is a Paso winery um Oh, it's named record uh, field recordings. I think they're doing one now too. Um, but oh, cool. the only other one that we could find when we first went out was uh, was uh, uh, there was one in like New Jersey, but it wasn't being it wasn't being uh, transported outside of the state. So, mm -hmm. um, but we've also got hops. Boy, they are the coolest things to grow. They just are. I mean, they're very cool, and they you know they grow up. So you've got to have them on um, on these strings and. They're, they're really, they smell so delicious and they're so pretty. I can really mm -hmm. smell the Cascade and the Chinook more so that like the Chinook on it. Yeah, Chinook like, is really strong. Yeah. Yeah. I love that hop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, what do you guys, what, what are the strategies that you implement to get these kinds of, so this is just a general question for, for everybody. Um, to get these weird varietals or these weird styles in front of somebody's face. Cause sometimes people are kind of like, Oh gosh, they're nervous about the wine list. And so they don't want to go with something, you know, petite for what, you know? Um, so how are you guys uh, combating that? You want somebody to jump in, raise their hand or something. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. I'll just jump in. Right. So um, yeah, I think it's for us, we sort of kind of went with the more genre approach to our label. So people kind of are drawn to the label first and then they kind of see what's going on. And we've had from critics, like everyone's always surprised that the wines are actually any good and they're not just like swill in the bottle. <laughs> but, but the way we deal with um, our customers, because again, we're not necessarily going for like a wine geeky crowd. We're going for people that might have enjoy wine, but aren't snobs. Um, we always sort of have to compare. We're like, oh, okay, well, it's, it's always an education, which is on one hand, a little bit harder of a sale. It actually isn't too difficult when we go to wine shops because obviously the people purchasing the wines already know they're familiar with the, with the bridles and what's different. So they, you know, in that respect, you know, promote it to their customers. But um, when it comes to like the general public or at like say a wine tasting or something, um, especially like during October, while I'm busy with harvest, my husband does a lot of, um, not last year, obviously, but the year before, he did a lot of uh, tastings at like horror themed events. And it's just basically constantly explaining, but a lot of it's like, well, Chenin Blanc is like 
Chardonnay, but not quite, or Petit Verdot is like Cabernet, but not quite. So it's kind of good. And that's kind of what we enjoy telling people something we haven't maybe heard of before. Yeah, and I would just say that, like, I personally thrive on educating people. So I think it, it works with my personality that I get really excited about sharing something new with people, even if they've been tasting yeah. wine for a really long time. And so, you know, once my enthusiasm comes out, it's it's takes it from there. <laughs> yeah. So would you say that um, the way to get your hands on these kinds of wines is much more like direct to the winery? Well, I make 250 to 300 cases, so definitely. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely, but probably for all of you guys, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we, we're we not much bigger than you because we make 400, so we're <laughs> still <laughs> like super small. But yeah, mostly, mostly the winery, yeah, everybody that comes is like really open actually to to learn about the variety and and yeah, just like, I think there's every time more like, and more here, like in, in California, I would say more than in Europe, people is like open to new things, like whatever mm -hmm. you give me, uh, I'm going to try it because yeah. it's more like, I don't know. And if they come to this area, I already know that we do a lot of different things. So people is open to it and it's good. You educate them, you teach them. It's fun. They like it. Yeah. <laughs> Since we got production sizes from two of you, can I hear uh, from Anna and then Karen? Yeah, yeah, like our first two vintages were a single ton each. So, you know, super small, but 60 something, 65 cases. But now we're doing about 200 to 300. Last year we did four whole tons. So that was super exciting. Um, so yeah, super small as well. And like kind of, you know, the same thing that Gretchen and, and Tara said, we direct to consumers kind of easiest for us to kind of get it out there. And Buttonwood? Oh, we make 8,000 cases. <laughs> <laughs> it's so we do about 8,000 cases. It's still super small in the grand scheme of the wine Everything. World. This is very um, true. It, well, it is comparatively, yes. But, but I have to say, oddly enough, um, Hop On is distributed. Oh, so funny. we distribute within California through Classic Wines of California. And... Um, my brand manager, my brand manager is Joseph Franzia. And he can, every time I talk to him, he always says like, I don't know about that hoppy thing. <laughs> and I said, but you know, when you go out, like, he also calls my Sauvignon Blanc, instead of calling a zing, he calls it the zinger. Uh, so, um, but like we have, you know, when we're out there, especially if you, if you find a brew pub that, doesn't carry wine this is kind of like a really nerdy cool thing for them the issue that we have with hop on well the issue we have with with uh, a lot of these ones that are kind of out outside because we do uh we do some weird things at buttonwood we do you know we do a pet nap not weird anymore we do a carbonic franc maybe not so weird we're doing carbonic malbec this year um wow. we do some weird co-ferment so um but with without having any events you know, without having like the Vendors Association Festival and things like that, it's really kind of hard to introduce these to people. And it is, as it is, I'm sure for you with your small brand. So hop on is always a challenge because the retailers don't know where to put it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into El Rancho and moved it out of the beer section. Yeah. And, and, like had to, you know, I had to say to Randy and then I, I kind of pity the poor person who takes it home and thinks it's like beer. <laughs> yeah, so, um, cases of, of hop on do you produce karen um about 200 cases oh nice yeah. oh, good yeah cool yeah well we i have to say that we have a little bit of distribution too we just started this year which is how a lot because we've been closed mostly all the time in the tasting room. So that, yeah. well, that's yeah. that's what I was gonna follow up with. Yeah. It's hard to do this direct to consumer and get it in front of people because of COVID. So that's great that you've been able to. Um, what's the word everyone's using? Pivot. Um, yeah. <laughs> we've been pivoting a lot to taste things online too. So that's that's how too. And yeah, yeah. I'm way past pivoting. And to pirouetting by now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're just dancing. <laughs> oh, cool. Do we have yeah. um, some final final comments to uh, I'm in land I'm in Los Olivos. You would not think it would be like this. I'm not like out in the middle of the country. 
Her internet is spazzing out. It's okay. Um, <laughs> are there any final words for our viewers about uh, different varietals, different styles, anything that you guys would like to close with? Come to Santa Barbara County. You're going to find a, a wide array of different varieties, and you don't really have to go too far. We're yeah. within a 35 mile radius, and um, anything you can think of, I think we grow here. So <laughs> come visit yeah, us. No. I would, I would, totally not. I would totally second that. I would say for us, we have obviously Shannon, which we we're showing, Petit Verdell, which we mentioned. We also are coming out with a Sangiovese and uh, an orange Viognier. So, you know, lots of weird small stuff. Just keeping it fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Anna, I think Sangiovese is perfect. Blood of Jove. I mean, for yeah. Yeah. Well, I, That's perfect. I didn't explain this before, but we do it not to like drag it on, but um, we sort of pair a final girl with every wine. So obviously for like this one, we do Dr. Ellie Sattler from Jurassic Park um, for our Petit Verdot, just because of like, if you go to the website, you can see our tasting notes, why we think it is, you know, Barbara from Night of the Living Dead. But our Sangiovese obviously is going to have to be Clarice Starling from Silence of the Lambs. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. saying the name of that movie makes me like scared. <laughs> that is again another challenge we have because a lot of people are like, I hate horror movies. But <laughs> small, we just need to get like a certain amount of people that do love horror movies and we'll be okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Gretchen, any final not off? Anything? Yeah, I mean I, I agree. Come come visit Santa Barbara County. Um I'm up in Ballard Canyon now. I didn't even show the label. But oh, wow. up in Ballard Canyon now, um, and it's beautiful, and it's new and small, a little garage east winery. So love to have you. I have a question for you, Gretchen, since you showed the label. What does Luna Heart mean? Yeah, so um, I had to do some rebranding when I originally picked my label in 2014. It was Moon Unit Wines, because that's what my dad calls me when I'm not around. Um, and I really like love the image of the sacred geometry moon fading into dust. Um, and so after getting a cease and desist followed by a, maybe we should do business together from moon unit Zappa. Um, I decided to go a different direction. <laughs> um, and I really wanted to pick something reflective of my style, which I see as a balance of feminine and masculine. So Luna is the feminine and heart is another word for stag. This is masculine. Oh, cool. Cool. Nice. Wow. And we have a, a question. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, we have a question from Facebook on whether we have some exciting rosés coming out from any of these labels. Any 2020 rosés hitting the, the stores? Yeah. Well, we're about to bottle next week our uh, rosé of Syrah from Coca Cola Vineyard. So that's um, actually a natural wine native fermented and uh it's organic fruit so that's kind of fun for us cool now I've got also rose oh, yeah. yeah oh let's hear from gretchen first <laughs> i said guys, also, with it. <laughs> yeah. um, also bottling rose of syrah in two weeks from the south end of ballard canyon high oh, cool. nice 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 and karen I think Karen beats everybody because she bottles in December, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> December. I, do. I bottle the same year we pick it. In fact, I've got my 2021 bottling date already. So, uh, you got to plan ahead these days, girls, because otherwise you're not going to be able to get your screw caps or your glass because there's horrible things out there. Because you took oh, it off. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> the Rosé of Grenache uh, just received 90 points from Wine and Spirits magazine. Uh, the Rosé of Syrah, which is our distributed one, uh, 90 points from Wine Enthusiast magazine. And they are out and available. We always release them on Valentine's Day weekend because they're pink. Oh. <laughs> I, need, I get a lot of pressure to do that, to bottle them so that they're able to release on February. But I... <laughs> Like, uh, when I have to do a special bottling just for this one wine, it doesn't really compute. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that's the, 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 that's the benefit of being able to do all the wines at Buttonwood. But, um, I mean, it, it kind of, uh, 
I mean, the way that we make rosé is just like, you know, once it's dry, it's done. Yeah. And it's, you know, we make 850 cases of the rosé uh, Syrah. So it's, a, it's, you know, we have our own lovely bottling line too. As Tara, yeah. Tara the other day, she came, she's yeah. like, you have your own bottling line? I'm I like, well. No, I didn't know that. That's her so name is Maria. Her name is Maria. I think she's older than I am. And that's pretty damn old. And, uh, <laughs> you got to throw holy water on her from at least two missions. You have to burn some sage and turn around counterclockwise naked on a full moon. And then she might work. So <laughs> you guys have all your like pieces and cogs up like an art behind <laughs> Anything to make her happy. Yeah. <laughs> I see a comment of uh, Final Girl Merlot Rosé is straight fire so good. Boom. You guys yeah. Merlot Rosé? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was our 2019. So we did, wow. uh, it was a Sonye from uh, Coco Co Vineyard as well. So that was kind of fun. That's and awesome. People love it. So that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, any other ones? Do we get all the rosés, all the new releases? We, we, make, we make a rosé, but unfortunately just not in 2020. <laughs> but we made it in 18 and 19, and we're going to make it again. And it's, it's a just, Sanye. It just oh, cool. it was such a small vintage for us on reds that we decided not to make the rosé because it's normally a Sanye, and it didn't happen. So, yeah. Fair yeah. Oh, it's, it, a, it's, come a, back. it's a rosé of Syrah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Nice. Nice. Very popular choice. <laughs> from here yeah <laughs> i mean there's so many amazing straws yeah yeah <laughs> all right i think that about does it for us tonight thank you everyone for uh showing up tonight thank you ladies for speaking to your varietals and your styles this has been a really fun event this month um if you missed any of our previous uh women winemaker chats those are all listed on Facebook as well as YouTube and IGTV. So you can see all of the previous episodes of this series. And like I mentioned before, make sure you don't miss out on the great discounts that these women are putting on their wines. They, there's discount codes or special uh, bundles, tons of really great stuff. But you only have how many days? What is it? Four, five days? Left? Five Tuesdays. Five days. So yeah. make sure you check out the link in the description below this video if you're on YouTube or in the event description if you're on Facebook. It's also on the link in our um, Instagram profile. So check those out. Get those shipped to you because, you know, 2021 is all the same. We need a lot of wine, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Absolutely. But I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah, for leading all of this for our all of us this month. And thank you to Buttonwood for actually being the host of all of this. We truly appreciate you guys for really helping bring us all together. And that's super And in amazing. 2022, it's going to be live, like real life. We're going to be yeah. there all together. We're going to be doing it again. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have the pre-party. <laughs> have that big party, yeah. Sarah, you've been awesome. Thanks for wrangling us. Awesome, yeah. ladies. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.